Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be starting the repair and restoration work on this Halicrafters HT40 amateur radio transmitter. I'll show its existing cosmetic and functional condition, determine the end state I want for the repairs and restoration, and complete the repairs to the power supply, including a demo of it working. The Hallicrafters Company was founded in 1932 by William J. Halligan. There's a lot of info about their history available online, and it does tell an interesting story about a company that started during the Great Depression, supported our military with communication gear during World War II, and continued to expand into consumer and amateur radio electronics during the 1950s and 1960s. Unfortunately, like a lot of electronics companies from that era, they weren't able to maintain a successful business for consumer electronics once solid-state displaced vacuum tubes, and so they became defunct in that market by the end of the 1960s. And 50 years later, there still is an active user community who collects and restores Halicrafters gear and specimens that are in good shape command a premium price. The HT40 is a simple amateur radio HF transmitter and was designed to support the novice license restrictions of that era. Namely, its lack of an integrated variable frequency oscillator, or VFO, and being limited to 75 watts maximum power input. It was available from 1960 to 1964 and could be purchased fully assembled or as a kit. And one more thing, while most Halicrafters gear is regarded as high performance design for its era, that really isn't the case for the HT40. If you read the online reviews about it, it isn't regarded as one of Halicrafters finest achievements. In fact, there are quite a few modifications, or corrections you could even say, that folks recommended be made to it to improve its performance. And I'll be looking at those for sure as I go through defining the scope of this project. Here's the HT40 sitting on my giant cake turntable, and there's a few things I want to talk about as we look at its initial condition. First of all, this is a project that I've already started, and I've gotten to the point where I've just finished the cosmetic cleanup. So a few things I had to address were the condition of the knobs were quite dirty and generally you can clean these pretty easily. Just a toothbrush and some dish soap seems to work just fine. In this case these have these nice almost like stainless steel inserts in the center and they were tarnished and they cleaned up real easy just using some stainless steel polish and that look much better. Fortunately, all the controls do work smoothly. Um, when I had the uh, chassis out of the case earlier, I checked to make sure that nothing was binding, and so these are all in good shape. One other cosmetic problem was one of the prior owners had decided to try and embellish these knobs with some red uh, marker, and out of the factory, the dots that are on here are very, very faint, hard to see, but adding the red just really made it look uh, awful, so I was able to carefully remove that, as well as some uh, red marks on the um, the bezel, or rather the front panel by the function switch. There is a little bit of wear. You can see that some of the text is worn away here, probably just from where operator's fingers happen to uh, uh, brush up against it and, and wear across it over the years. I'll spin it around so we can get a good look at the sides and the back, and you can see there's a lot of gloss in the paint still, but unfortunately there's a lot of scratches and wear and tear. And I'll show the top of the case here in a little bit, and it's the worst of all. So unfortunately, I'm gonna, I am going to have to repaint this to make it look acceptable. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out as we look at the back here, there were factory labels that were still holding on even after almost, well, probably more than 50 years. But they are a little bit beat up, and part of the paper has just fallen away. And the most significant piece that's fallen off is the serial number, and I did manage to save it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to reattach that or not, but definitely just want to hold on to it so I have it. I did cut the power cord. It was in terrible shape and I need to replace it anyway. As you can see, I've had the screws out uh, already to be able to pull the chassis out to do that assessment. 
And here's the chassis removed from the case. Now, as I mentioned, I have already pulled the chassis out a couple times before because I'd cleaned it up. And when I received this radio, it was pretty filthy on the inside. The usual amount of uh, dust and accumulated grime over the years needed to be cleaned off. And it's pretty easy to remove that. There's a procedure online that involves using some pretty heavy duty detergent and water. And of course, being careful not to get the water into areas where you don't want it, in particular the meter. So I removed that and cleaned that separately. And as I mentioned, I had already cut the power cord on this because it was in really bad shape. I needed to replace it anyway. Now you probably noticed that the, uh, the two power supply filter caps are hanging down. I'd already cut those on one end to do a quick check on them to see what their uh, condition was like. And not surprising, they need to be replaced. I've turned the chassis over to the underside so we can get a good look at it. And right away, uh, when you're working on an old radio like this, it's very telling the history um, of what the radio is seen just by looking at the underside, I think, more than the top side. Top side does tend to get really dirty because that's where all the dust is naturally going to fall. But on the underside, even a really filthy radio on top generally looks almost factory original underneath. If you open one up and see mud and other signs that it's been in a flood, then you know you really got a, a dud. But this one's in really good shape from what... Uh, uh, what uh, it's, it's seen over its life and looking at what to replace you of course look for things that might be burned or cracked or broken the most obvious things and even though this resistor right here this is resistor R26 it's a 20 ohm 7 watt resistor that's right off the power supply I'm kind of on the fence about that. There's there is a crack in it that does test out fine so uh, we'll see. I'm not sure if I'm going to replace that just yet. The electrolytic and the film capacitors, on the other hand, though, I show no mercy on these old radios. They all get replaced. In fact, there's even more reason here on these electrolytics because a couple of them are starting to have oozed electrolyte out from the vent hole, so clear sign that they've got to go. And there's only, I think, three film capacitors uh, in this design, so it just isn't worth the time and energy to deliberate whether to keep them. You, know, you get one that starts leaking, and you're going to get in a, in a world of hurt with the, um, the two bias and from one, you know, coupling one stage to the other and they've just got to go. I know audiophile folks tend to want that particular style cap sometimes and that's, you know, fair enough for their applications. But when you're working in a transmitter or a receiver, it, there just isn't any justification to keep them. Jumping back over to the electrolytic capacitors, I did want to share an observation. These two are the same manufacturer but these two are different and they clearly and obviously don't match these first two. So it's highly likely that these two have been replaced at some point in the radio's life. Uh, all four of them are 40 microfarad, but only these are 350 volts. These are higher, 450. So another clue that perhaps they've been replaced. At any rate, I am going to replace these with four of the same. And like any modern capacitor, they are a lot smaller. So here's a... 47 mic 450 volt capacitor that you can get today so getting these to fit in there should be pretty easy and one last item of curiosity these two guys here are actually RF chokes and I wasn't familiar with that shape and had to do a little uh, cross-referencing of the schematic to um, items online and sure enough that's what they are and one more comment on the overall condition I did check all of the resistors uh, throughout the transmitter. There aren't that many to check and there are a few that are out of tolerance. I will be replacing those as well. I've turned the chassis back right side up to round out the assessment of the initial condition of this radio. So a few last things to talk about. Uh, when I received this, this choke here, this is the um, this is L13. It's a 425 millihenry choke. Fortunately, that was broken off and laying down on the side of the chassis, and right now it's just barely attached on. And I haven't looked at it yet to see if the ceramic is cracked, but that uh, worst case may need a little epoxy or creative repair to get it uh, structurally sound again. And you probably notice that the wires are off the meter, and I did disconnect it when I re removed it from the panel, like I mentioned for cleaning. But another thing I always do on these old radios is make sure the meter actually works. And and it's usually easy to find what the rating of the meter is. And in this case, it's a 5 milliamp uh, full scale. So it's fairly simple to set up a circuit and put a variable amount of current, you know, 1 milliamp through 5 milliamps through it. And it tracked nicely. So from the end of the scale um, on the left at 0 up to, to 5 on the right, it's not 
uh, subdivided at all. It's basically just a simple indication and it seemed to track well. So I think the meter should be working just fine. I also did an ohms check on the power transformer, this big guy here, and on this 5 Henry choke. This is L12 that's in the power supply. And before diving in and spending a lot of money on a project like this, you want to make sure that any of these two monsters, or either of these two monsters rather, are still good, that there aren't any open circuits. If there are, then the repair costs can go up quite a bit and maybe not even make it worthwhile to repair. But they both check fine. And of course the assessment wouldn't be complete without examining the vacuum tubes and I didn't forget them. They've been missing from our views so far, but here they are. Put, always put these in something to keep them uh, protected, in this case an old egg crate. And what I've done, of course off camera, is I've used a simple tube tester. In my case it's a Sencor TC162 to evaluate them. And what it'll do, it'll check them to make sure there's no shorts. It'll check the emissions. Essentially just makes the tube into a diode. It interconnects all the uh, grids in such a way that you're just basically checking it as a diode. And then also look for any grid leakage. So it doesn't do a quantitative um, uh, emissions test, but it certainly uh, is good for a qualitative test. It'll tell you if any of these tubes have serious problems. So they're good enough according to that test to, to move forward and see if they'll actually function in the transmitter when I have it put back together. And of course I got a little bit of cleaning. Still have the original dirt. You could, uh, I guess you could characterize it on the 6DQ5, the, the output tube here. So a little bit of cleaning and a little careful cleaning, I should say, because in most of these tubes, as they age, the, the graphics, the um, uh, ink, or in some cases, it's basically just like a powder that they put on there to indicate the tube value. comes off real easy, so you do have to uh, be careful, be cautious, and um, just work around any text that's on there, and don't just assume that it's permanent. At this point, I've completed my inspection of the unit, and as best as I can determine, I found all the defects. What I need to do now is define what the scope of work is going to be for this project, including defining the uh, end state, which is a step that can't be ignored. When I'm done with this project, I definitely want to use it on the air. I also want it to look good sitting next to the other radios in my shack, but realistically don't expect it to look like new. And I do have realistic limits on just how much money and time I want to spend on this project, especially given that I have other items that I want to start after finishing it. So with that all taken into consideration, here's the scope of work for this project. First off is to perform the repairs necessary to restore the transmitter to full function. So things like replace the electrolytic and film capacitors, replace the out-of-tolerance resistors, repair the physical damage to the RF choke, and any other minor issues I might find as I go along. Second is to perform some limited cosmetic repairs. In this case, it's limited to repainting the case. And finally, there are some modifications and improvements I want to make. And I want to thank Phil, amateur call sign AC0OB, who's worked on HT40s for years and has a very detailed list of information he's published online for his thoughts on how to improve this design. Earlier, I showed some snippets of the schematic, and here I'm showing the complete layout. Now be aware that there are at least two major revisions of the HT40 design. Mine appears to be a later production version where Halicrafters had incorporated some design improvements. I'll go through each stage of the circuit in the second video of this series, but for now, the area I want us to concentrate on is the power supply. That's what I'm going to repair first, and that's what's located here at the bottom of the page. I've magnified the power supply section so we can see it more clearly, even though this older scan is not very high resolution. So a couple of things to note on the design here. Uh, basically, it's a voltage doubler taking 195 volts AC, as it says on the secondary side, to 430 volts to 500 volts DC. Now, elsewhere in the schematic, they say that depends on the function switch setting, and of course that is determined by the load on the power supply at the time. It's gonna vary. Of course, there's 6.3 volts AC for the vacuum tube heaters. Now, looking at the primary side, um, one thing that really stands out, there's a Pi RF filter on the mains, so that's great to help prevent the transmitted RF harmonics from getting back on the AC circuit. But also notice where the power switch is. It's not in a safe area because a lot of the circuit is already live downstream of um, the plug. So that's not very safe by today's standards. And of course, looking at the plug, it's only a two-pronged power cord. Again, those types of things are pretty common from a radio or any kind of plug-in device uh, from that era. And then lastly, there's no fuse. So that's also an element that's not very safe. 
And then here I'm showing the end state. These are the modifications I plan to make. So looking from left to right, one of the things I do like to do on these old radios where space permits is put in a standard modern three wire connector. And that allows putting a cord on when you're using it and taking the cord off when you're done. That also gives me a chance to ground this chassis more safely. So we'll be adding that feature. And then a good practice with a radio this old or any electronics this old is to add a fuse. And that always goes best immediately off the hot. And that's so that if the fuse does blow, you have the minimal amount of exposed and live conductor on the inside of the radio. And I've also moved the switch from where it was to much closer to the hot side. And that's right after the fuse. Then if you look at the four... Uh, 0.001 microfarad capacitors in the pie filter, I'm going to be changing those out. Those are typically just plain ceramic caps, and it's the same case with this radio too. There's modern safety caps, in this case a Y2 rated cap that's rated to go from mains to uh, chassis ground like that. I'll be putting those in. Now looking at the secondary side of the transformer, what I'll be doing is replacing the two rectifier diodes, the 1N4007s. Those are rated for one kilovolt peak inverse voltage, so plenty of headroom there. And then lastly, as I showed earlier in the video, the four filter capacitors, I'm going to be swapping those out for modern 47 mic, 450 volt rated units. All right, I finished the repairs to the power supply section on the HT40, and there's lots to talk about here. So let's start with the AC side of the circuit. So as I mentioned, I did replace the power cord with a standard three prong socket. And doing this is fairly easy. These older radio chassis are made from a fairly soft aluminum. So just using a pair of hand nibblers doesn't take very long to uh, create a, a large enough aperture to put this snap in socket. So that allowed me to add a separate ground wire, which you can kind of see back here in the background. That's um, crimped to a crimp connector and soldered and, and heat shrinked. So that's nice and neatly tucked down there in the bottom. Moving on, I did replace the four ceramic capacitors with those Y2 safety capacitors for the Pi filter, for the RF uh, Pi filter. And then here's the fuse I added. So right now I just put in a 4 amp fuse. I might change the size a bit later, but just for starters, it's a, it's a 4 amp fuse. And then looking up towards the top, I did end up replacing that 20 ohm resistor. I looked at my parts box and I had some uh, 10 ohm 5 watt resistors. I just put two of those in series to get to the right resistance and it's probably a little overkill on uh, power dissipation but that should be just fine. Then over to the right you see this guy right here this 24k resistor that actually was something I found as I went through it's a 22k per the schematic but it had been so overheated that the color bands had um, altered to the point where it looks like a 22 ohm resistor and I think I know why when I looked underneath that 22 ohm resistor I saw where there was a solder flake that had been dislodged and might have created a short circuit um, that solder flake probably came from a hack repair that was done on this radio years ago I noticed the these two capacitors that when I re took them out to replace them and that 22 ohm resistor and the two diodes all have just been tack soldered so that's a unfortunate common repair done where someone doesn't want to take the time to unsolder the joints at these terminal strips and just cuts off the wire leaves a stub and then just in the in floating air tacks on the replacement component so not a good practice and i think that's what happened it ended up dislodging a piece of solder over time and shorting things out the last clue that makes me think that is on the two diodes that were there these two guys right here when I put those on the meter to check them, this one checks fine with a normal about a 0.4 volt, I think it was, forward voltage drop and, and no current flowing in reverse. This guy was open in both directions, so something had to have happened um, at one point to damage that diode, and it could have been that, that solder flake that shorted out. Next item, there were several spots here where I had to replace some wiring. Uh, for example, the little uh, bridge that connects the ends of these two caps, the a neutral side connector over to here. I have in my stash a small amount of, I guess you could say period correct, uh, wire that I've saved over the years and it's still in pretty good shape. Um, the insulation is not cracked on it yet. It's got a cloth covering on it and they're very colorful so wherever possible I like to use little pieces of that to, to make up 
uh, connections that need to repair. But you also see some orange colored material here. And what that is, that's Teflon sleeving. And I try to put that wherever practical on um, the higher voltage interconnects uh, when they're close to each other, just to provide a little extra insulation in case of a possible short circuit. And in most cases, on, a, on an axial lead cap, what I'll do, I'll put it on the end the in this case it's the positive end just to provide a little more insulation on the negative end it isn't really so practical because there's an exposed metal cap there that it really doesn't benefit to put any extra insulation you've already got a lot of exposed area there anyway that you can't do anything about and then moving on to the dc side of the circuit as i mentioned i replaced all four of the filter caps and hidden behind this guy right here down in this area are the two 1n4007 rectifier diodes that um, I put in with some of that uh, orange Teflon tubing for a little bit of extra insulation. And then one final comment, when I put these axial lead caps, I like to follow a best practice that I've seen other folks do too. You don't want to put those in straight. You want to put a little bend or kink or arch in the cap. The reason being, the thought being that if they're straight, what might happen during thermal expansion and contraction, if the part can't move slightly, you might put some tensile forces on this lead, on the positive lead, and possibly pull it out of the cap. So putting a little um, little bend in there so there's some compliance in the lead is, is thought to be a good idea. And it's, it's easy and quick to do, so just might as well do it. So at this point, I've completed all of the repairs to the power supply. And what I like to do on these radio repairs is pause at this point on the repairs and proceed to do testing of the power supply. That way I know that it's working and that there aren't any other issues in that part of the circuit before I spend any more time and money repairing the rest of the radio. So that's what I'll be doing next. Okay, it's moment of truth time. Time to see if the power supply is working. And in order to make that determination, I've taken a few more toys off the shelf here. Um, the first one here on the left, this is my custom made combination AC voltmeter, variac, isolation transformer, and dim bulb tester. So those four together in one box is an excellent tool to help me safely power up radios after I've repaired them and just ramp that AC voltage up and carefully see that everything is working normally. Uh, the two guys on the right on top is my Heath kit uh, vacuum tube voltmeter IM13. I love using it to measure higher voltages DC. It goes all the way up to 1500 volts and being vacuum tube based, it's a little more tolerant of spikes and variant and varying voltages and um, would rather use it than my uh, DMM for these types of measurements. Now below that, I've got my Keithley 177. That guy is set up to measure the AC uh, filament voltage that comes out of the um, uh, secondary of the transformer and just to mix a little digital technology in with analog just for the fun of it. Now, there are risks, obviously, when you're working a high voltage. If you're following along with your own radio, you're doing so at your own risks. And one thing that I do to minimize my risk, my personal risk when working on these radios, is make all of the connections and just stand back and control only the voltage through this knob. So I'm not putting my hands in the chassis when I'm when I'm actually have this live. I can just look at the results on the meters to verify everything's working right. So with that said, what I will do is turn the radio to the standby mode. So that will let the power supply come on. I've got the Variac set to zero and I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And there is a slight amount of voltage coming through, but what we'll do now is turn up the voltage and with this dim bulb over here, if there's not, hardly any current being drawn here, which I expect there be, that bulb should not light up. If that bulb starts going bright, then that tells me I've got a problem, either a short or something similar, it's causing too much current to be drawn. So as I ramp this up, you can see the output voltage on the vacuum tube voltmeter starting to come up. I'm at about uh, 40 volts now on AC. I'll pause there for a moment. And I'm about 200 volts DC on the secondary and about 2.6 volts AC on the filament voltage, so that's good. And the bulb is not glowing, so that's also a good sign. So I'll keep going to about, uh, let's say, 90 volts here. And pause there. Same thing, this bulb's not lighting up. I'm up to over 400 volts on the secondary for DC and about 5.7, so uh, 5.7 volts on the filament winding, so that's good. So might as well push it to 115 which is about my max for my Variac. 
Now, it may not come up on the camera, but there is a slight glow happening in that dim bulb now, which is expected because there is going to be some loss in the power supply, even here in standby mode through the, um, the choke and the, the bleeder resistors, etc. So that's fine. And on the vacuum tube voltmeter, I'm just over 500 volts, and I'm about 7.16 volts AC, give or take, on the filaments. So this looks good. I think these are uh, right within expectation. So we can move on with the, the rest of the radio project now. So thanks for watching today's video on the HT40. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them below. In the future video, I'll be going through the completion of the restoration repairs and get into some of the modifications I mentioned earlier and get this transmitter working again. So until then, bye for now.